Hi, in this lecture we're going to just uh, review conservation of mass. We're going to do it from a control volume approach and uh, overall you should know that this is called the Reynolds Transport Theorem. Uh, it's just nice to know some of these definitions. So you're familiar with the conservation equations, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And if you were to look at these equations, there's three of them, uh, or if you wanted to write them as scalar equations, there'd be five scalar equations. There's more unknowns in those equations than there are um, uh, equations, so we need other equations to give us a system we can solve. So we introduce things like the stress-strain relationship that we talked about last time, or ideal gas relations. Uh, for uh, for uh, gases or for a solid, there's an ideal gas relation or a, a equation of state for a solid. The relationship between energy and temperature, Fourier's law. It goes on and on and on. However many equations we need to get enough equations to uh, to have a, a solvable set. But keep in mind, these guys, they're not conservation laws, right? They don't always hold under all conditions. These equations do. They are. Uh, what, that's why they're called the conservation. These are just observations that, that various materials follow. All right, so the control volume approach, you remember you typically would, if we were analyzing some, some problem like this, uh, we would draw a control volume about, about the object and have a look at it. This is, the, uh, this is the Reynolds transport theorem, or the integral approach, control volume approach for conservation of mass. So if we look at the first term, there's an integral of the, of the density times volume. So density times volume has units of mass. So we're integrating some small mass, some differential mass, over a control volume, and we're taking the time rate of change of it. So I'm just showing you what that term represents in terms of uh, words. These three terms, velocity dotted with the normal vector of a unit area. So if you have a unit area and the normal velocity vector is uh, pointing uh, outwardly normal of that unit area, and you dot it with a velocity vector, some velocity vector, what you're doing is you're resolving the vector within that plane, right? That's what a dot product is. You're saying, what's the, what is the component of the velocity that points into that small unit area? So that's the velocity perpendicular to the control surface. And uh, we multiply that times the uh, mass flux. Uh, we multiply it times the density to get the mass flux. And then we integrate that uh, across the entire control surface to get the mass uh, flow rate through that control surface. All right. So consider this kind of classic problem. You've got some, some jet here that's shooting a liquid, uh, and it's hitting this uh, plate, and it's causing a force that you're, uh, that you're acting against with some applied load to keep it in equilibrium. So the way we would approach this is, first you have to draw the control volume. Without the control volume, you can't do the analysis, because you're applying the equations to the control volume. We delete what's in the control volume. Once we draw the control volume, the beauty of it is we get rid of all the physics inside. So we're just looking at the surface of the control volume. We identify the control surfaces. Those are where does mass flux across the control volume. And each little area here that I've denoted in the red represents a control surface. So for this particular analysis, we have two control surfaces. All right, so let's go through this. Um, a, a bit more. Let's talk about the steady unsteady assumption. So steady unsteady has to do with this term right here, this partial partial t. If the flow is unsteady, then partial partial t is not zero. If it is steady, partial partial t is zero. So it would be great if I could say that term is zero, right? So steady is if anything in the control volume is changing, then the, st the system is unsteady. So it's obvious, it's like this balloon, it's being uh, blown up maybe with helium from a supply line. If I draw the control volume uh, around the balloon, then at some time later, the mass is changed uh, in the balloon, in the control volume, so this is an unsteady problem. Whereas that jet problem that we looked at earlier, we could probably consider that steady, because I look at it at some time, T1, I look at it some time later, T2, it doesn't change, so it looks the same. So that means that partial partial T is zero, and our equation simplifies. So the steady state form of our equation is this guy right here. So open and close means if mass is fluxing. So in the previous statement, we said if anything changes. Open and close refers to just the mass, because we're talking about just this term here. 
So in this problem, this is an open system because mass is fluxing across the control volume there through the control surface. That's what the control surface is. In this previous problem, we had two control surfaces. Mass is fluxing across that control surface, those two control surfaces. So in the previous problem, I have to, I have to retain that partial partial t term, but I repeat the integral one time for this control surface. See, this is CS1, CS1. I have one flux integral. In this problem that was steady, I don't have that d by dt term. It's gone here. But I have two control surfaces. So I have to repeat this term twice, once for control surface 1, once for control surface 2. So keep that in mind, that really maybe we should have written this as the sum of all the control surfaces. That might have been a better way to write it. But in general, we would repeat that, that number of flux surfaces for each control surface in our control volume. Is it compressible or incompressible? That just means, does the density change? It's not so obvious sometimes. Like in a problem like this, where the uh, volume, the, sorry, the mass within that control volume is fixed, and the volume changes, if the mass is fixed and the volume changes, it's obvious that the density is changing. However, for uh, a system like this, where the tank is filling, it might not be so obvious to us that, um, that the density is constant, so we would have to rely on, well, is it isothermal and is the pressure changing? And if those two are not changing, then we might uh, safely say that the density is constant. What about something like an external flow? Uh, I would be inclined to think if I saw that shock wave there that the density is changing. The rule of thumb is in a flow field, if the Mach number is greater than 0.3, then we have to consider the changing uh, compressibility of the gas. What about this one? This is always one that, that, that is hard, because in this problem, the control volume is changing, and simultaneously, the amount of mass is changing. But I would say, since the pressure inside of this balloon is pretty much in equi equilibrium with the atmospheric pressure, and the temperature is pretty much in equilibrium with the atmospheric temperature. If the temperature and pressure aren't changing, I'd go ahead and assume that that problem was uh, constant density. All right, what about this last one, viscid or inviscid? So here are some real velocity profiles. This is the average profile in a laminar flow. It's very long and skinny. And the average profile in a turbulent flow it tends to be a little fat and squattier. These are viscous flows. They're satisfying the no-slip boundary condition. This is reality. This is, what, uh, this is what the average flows look like in a pipe. This inviscid plug flow, this is total fiction. This doesn't exist. But it's a great assumption because it helps us simplify these integrals. So the assumption is, is that we'll replace this complex shape with just a plug. Right? So I'm looking for the average velocity in this pipe, the average velocity. And I'm going to say the profile looks something like this. So it's like a plug of a fluid that's sliding along the pipe, and it's not satisfying the no-slip boundary condition. But if I make that assumption, it'll greatly simplify my analysis. right? Because if I say that the velocity is constant, that velocity there can pop out of the integral, so to speak. right? So what it does for me is it reduces this integral. If this comes out and it's incompressible, it reduces this integral to an algebraic form like this, just rho VA. And so that's how we end up with, for steady state, for steady, open systems, incompressible, plug flow, if we make those assumptions, we end up with this classic equation that you're used to, where each one of those is the mass flux term. All right, let's apply this. If the average velocity is one at, at, at station one is five meters per second, and the average velocity at station two, uh, what is the average velocity at station two? I'm giving you the uh, diameter of uh, stations one and station two, and you have a, a section of things to choose from there. So the first thing we got to do is draw the control volume. And this seems kind of, you know, like it's not necessary, but really it get in the habit of doing that. Let's assume uh, steady or unsteady flow. I think we could assume steady flow. So what that does for us is gets rid of that term right there. Is it open or closed? Well, for this control volume, it's definitely open. Mass is fluxing across there. And there's two flux surfaces, one and two. So I'm going to write this integral twice, in and out. So it's plus and plus. Right? 
Is it compressible or incompressible? I think I'm going to go with uh, incompressible here because I don't know anything else about what this, what this fluid even is. And one point, it's going pretty slow, right? Five meters per second. So in uh, the sound speed of air is 350 <clears throat> meters per second. The sound speed in liquids, even uh, water is even faster. So we're very, very far away from 0.3 Mach number. Anyway, if it is incompressible, so I'm assuming incompressible here, notice the density term pops out of the integral. Viscid or inviscid? Well, I'm not given the profile here, so I'm going to assume inviscid. I'm going to assume it's plug flow. And when I do that, that the velocity then pops out of those. And recognize that now I'm no longer dealing with a function of x, r, and theta, and possibly t. I'm just saying it's the average velocity at that station. So all that's left is the integral of r dr d theta, which is just the area, right? So I end up with uh, this, uh, this integral here. Now notice, where did the sign come from? The sign came from the fact that the unit normal uh, definition for the flux surface 1 is to the left. The unit normals always point outwardly normal. And so that's a minus i. So that's where that sign comes from. Don't be putting that sign right there, the, ni the minus sign, because that's a flux, that's, a, that's an n integral. The sign comes from the unit normal. Now, if you just jump straight away to this equation, you would say that, well, it's minus because it's an inlet. But I wanted to show you where that minus sign came from. Well, you can easily rearrange and solve this and you get 45 meters per second. So that makes sense. If you look at it, it's going in to the big section. It narrows. I'm considering it to be an incompressible flow, so the flow's got to speed up so that the mass flux at each station is constant. If the area is reduced, the velocity has to increase, and that makes a lot of sense. All right. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.